I am so excited we have Priscilla Sai. She's the CEO and founder of Coco Kind. And she is a very kind person, but her background is dynamic. And uh, Priscilla, I wanted to have you on because not only is Coco Kind such an extraordinary company, but I was looking at the combination of your background. You know, I love mm -hmm. to put people in their buckets and say, oh, you know, she's a Wharton grad and so she's an academic person or she's this creative artist that the one thing that stood out for me that I would never would have expected by seeing your picture and reading your bio is you're a door knocker. You're a straight out <laughs> hustler. You are yeah. a workhorse. You are a Dave Meltzer girl that will go out <laughs> there and make it happen beyond yeah. your brilliance, genius, and creativity. Where did that come from that you literally just, you know, knocked on the doors of Targets and Whole Foods and, you know, whether it was grind or grit, you were going to get it done and get your products into those stores and get them their opportunity that they deserve. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's, um, I, I think that's been a key, uh, key, key reason for success here. I think, um, so I come from an immigrant family. My parents are both from Taiwan and immigrated here um, to, to pursue their education. And my parents um, very much like lived the American dream, did well for themselves, worked super, super hard. Um, just always grew up with this mentality that like you have to work so hard and like put in your time, put in the effort. Um, and that's what really they, they encouraged us to do. Um, you know, I think a lot of Chinese families can, can relate to just the, uh, you know, you hear a lot of the tiger mom stories, but that's very much the, the family that I grew up in. Um, I think what's, what's really symbolic of like that, that type of belief is, when for all of the children in my family, my, my parents really forced us, um, our first job to be working in quick service restaurants. And we wanted to work in, we were born here. We, you know, had just such an amazing upbringing and we were so fortunate. And um, I remember I wanted to work at like Nordstrom's or I wanted to work at Abercrombie and Fitch and I wanted to, you know, work or work at the ice cream shop. And my parents pretty much told us like, you have to work at a fast food restaurant that has to be your first job. And so, you know, my sister worked at McDonald's. I worked at Sod Rockers. Um, McDonald's wasn't hiring. So I had to go to the next, next, next restaurant next door. Um, my brother worked as a dishwasher at Panera Bread. And, and that was something that they, they just really wanted us to learn how, like the true value of money and hard work. And that, you know, it, was, it wasn't gonna be easy and you had to put in a lot of just uh, uh, your dedication, your commitment to understanding like how to earn a dollar and do that by yourself, no matter how much they were able to provide to us. So I think um, I always had a little bit of that spirit. My mom is actually a small business owner. So I feel really fortunate actually that, um, you know, not a lot of my friends had the example that I had growing up with a mom who, um, worked super hard, um, was, you know, very much equal when it came to um, the economics of our family. She, she led a business, she grew a business, um, and it was a business that, you know, no one would have expected her to, to lead. She, um, it's, her business is distributing nuts and tools to distributors in the Midwest. And she started as a clerk there, and she ended up buying the business from the owner eight years later. Um, and so we kind of have this like just hustler mentality a little bit in our family. It's a, it's a combination of hard work, but also just, just, um, determination too. And, and that's very much, um, how I grew up and, and how I started the business. It's so interesting. Cause I had a mom, a single mom that raised six kids. All my siblings went to the Ivy leagues, including two of them at Wharton. And one word that is in the title of your company is, is kindness. And although my mom worked two jobs and packed my dinner in a paper bag and had us read to each other in a station wagon, uh, you know, there was no equating uh, to that education of watching. Uh, but my mom was also very kind. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why, you know, out of all the names you could have, the combination of including that word kind or kindness within mm -hmm. the context of your business, how does kindness or, or being kind uh, relate to your business or how important was that and what you took from your upbringing? Yeah, I mean, I think it was something that's been so important to me. One of the main reasons why I started this business um, was to try to change the way business is done a little bit, especially within the beauty industry. Um, 
And the idea of being a social entrepreneur um, or an entrepreneur that is building a for-profit business, but doing that in a better way was always extremely appealing to me. And that's really how Coco Kind was started. Um, I think for us, it, it means uh, there's so many ways that that comes across. One is in our communication to our customers. Um, obviously, it's in the organizational growth. Um, it's also in our how we view our impact on the environment, um, transparency, all of that. It comes across, and, and it's really about just trying to do business in a better way. Um, and I really feel like that is what differentiates us um, not only as a brand, um, because it's very visible and it's, it's very much communicated transparently to our customers, but, um, but as an organization too. So um, I think it's like one of the, the main reasons why I started this business. If it wasn't for that consciousness that we bring to what we do, I definitely wouldn't be doing this. One of the things that's so interesting to me is with your new product launch, you deal with the main nuance of my life perspective, which is you can't find outside of you what you can't find inside of you. Mm -hmm. And with beauty bevs, you're looking with the healing within to create a beauty outside, but yet then you have the SPF product, which is one of the number one, I was blessed to meet with the Surgeon General and asked him what our greatest health concerns were and skincare was in the top three, along with of course, uh, heart care and diabetes or overeating. Um, and, and those types of things. But mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that you have this great launch of two products that are so complementary to one another, but yet if people from the outside were looking at your normal CPG SKUs, uh, they would say, well, this seems very diverse that you're you know, in this wellness space of inside healing, but also protecting our skin uh, in, on the SPF side. But I see how they are truly interrelated. For you, you know, what was the decision in making this the next product launch for you with such a you know, diverse type of offering? Yeah, I think for us, like it's part of it is also just doing something exciting and new. Um, and, you know, as a, as a brand, we balance giving the products that people have been asking us for like many, many years, like an SPF, which took us three years to develop um, with a product that they're not going to expect whatsoever, um, like our beauty beds, um, that are important to me that I've cultivated and I, I, that, that, that I've used for so many years, but that would be really unexpected to our customers too. And seeing if we can push the boundaries a little bit on, on what beauty means and, and having it not just be a, a topical or superficial thing, but something that you're really promoting, promoting the thought process of evaluating what you're taking in internally and externally. So um, to me, it was just something that was personally something that, something that I drink every single day, but also that I knew was going to be a new exciting category that I you know, wanted to test with our customer base. And then your mindset is so strong. And I'd love to hear how that mindset of yours has helped you through the accelerated change that we have, especially in your space, uh, running a small business during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, resilience is key. I think every entrepreneur, entrepreneur knows that you... Um, Every day you experience some sort of success, some sort of failure, and um, it can really eat away at you. And so the next day, there's really no choice um, but to come back at it and, and be resilient. Um, I think it's a rare kind of type of person who is going to be willing to suffer <laughs> through all the unique failures of an, that an entrepreneur faces. Um, but in it, in it, you have to have like some um, over index amount of uh, pleasure with the building a business in order to um, withstand all the, the, the stuff that you have to take on. And um, I think that that's something that I've learned no matter you know, how much, how, how, how determined I was at the beginning of this business. I think that resilience is something that you grow through time too, because you just go through a lot um, and you have to shoulder a lot. So. Uh, I don't think it's something that I necessarily knew what I was getting into. I think I, you don't know what you don't know in the beginning, but um, after many years, I know that resilience is something that you have to grow even stronger and stronger every single day. Well, it's so funny when you say that because I always say 
People don't mind hard, but they hate long. And most entrepreneurs, including me, if somebody would have told me what I have to go through in order to get here uh, through the years of trials yeah. and through the lessons, I'm not sure you know, I could have uh, withstood the uh, resilience of the long <laughs> combined with the hard. Uh, another blend that I see within the context of not only of your business, but you personally, is a beautiful blend of persistent, ferocious, you know, that, you know, badass behavior that I was talking about, but also with an allowance. You know, I think one of the toughest things to help young entrepreneurs when I'm coaching them is, look, it's okay to be a tiger. It's okay to be a pit bull that onto a, a tire, but you have to learn to attach all of those emotions to your pursuit, not the outcome. The outcome you have to allow to happen combined with this resilience. What have you learned about that blend of the ferocious behavior that's innate within you know, your being combined with this more uh, enlightened allowance and patience, which seems counterintuitive to most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't know if I've really, I, I'm definitely not a patient person and I haven't given myself too much allowance there. I yeah. think for me, the, the balance is actually, um, you know, being so determined and, and so goal oriented ver and also being really humble and self-reflective. Um, I think that you can't really do one without the other, at least in my, with my personality. Um, I think that there's a humility that is really necessary in what we do. Um, in you know, just my job of, of leading this company, there's so many times where you just don't get it right. Um, and you need to be able to self-reflect and be able to express that humility and keep learning. And so that's definitely not something that I'm shy about expressing to my team all the time or expressing to even our customers, right? Like it, it, we, we take a humble approach because we, we know that a customer will hang with us if we explain to them our journey. But if we pretend to be perfect, um, and, and we, we don't explain any of that journey, she's going to ditch us the moment we make a, a mistake. And, and so I think it's just important. That's always been my, um, attitude towards learning generally is just be, be humble. Um, and, and you're going to learn a lot more and you'll probably end up achieving a lot more of your goals than you thought. And do you distinguish between the goals that you set for Coco Kind as a company and the vision you have for the business or do you see them one and the same? Um, you know, I, I do think they're different. I think like the vision for me, I've always wanted to create a, a company that has impact on the industry and impact on the consumers that we're very much dealing with like a one-way conversation, beauty companies telling consumers what they needed to do. And um, so I've always wanted to have just like a larger impact on the beauty industry. And that's the overall vision. Um, the goals we set are going to be way more tactical, you know, a little bit um, more aggressive sounding, right? And uh, and so it is a little bit different, but my overall vision, it kind of stays intact no matter what goals we have from year to year. One of the things that I've noticed about your company and your SKUs and the distribu distribution that you have is that you have innate ability to connect with the customer. You know, people mm -hmm. out of motion for logical reasons. And I feel this great energy that, you know, as you look at the products that you have and where they're distributed, there's, you know, a certain frequency that I think relates or at least connects to the customers. What were some of the things that you intentionally did to create that emotional attachment and connection with the customer? Um, yeah, I mean, I look at our business and our brand as like, I'm just the person behind it. We're just people behind the brand. And so we don't look at it as much like this is our company. This is our company strategy for how to build a lasting attachment with our customer. It's more like I'm a person and I'm talking to another person. And how do I want to be spoken to um, from a skincare company or from a CEO of a skincare company? And um, how do I just like build a relationship? And that's very much how I feel we've, we, what we bring to the table is this level of personalization. Like you said, you know, I did build this business door to door. Um, and for the first year of this business, I was literally 
before we became more of a digital brand, I was literally doing demos, like three, four demos a week for three hours each at different Whole Foods stores all around California. And I would talk to like one customer at a time. And over a period of three hours, I would talk to only like 12 people, which is just like terrible in terms of economics. But, but you know, that's, I, I tell my team like that one-on-one -on -one experience um, that I had back in that first year of doing a demo, like that's what I want to bring digitally, no matter how many people are talking to at once um, because we're people at the end of the day speaking to people who just want to be heard um, and want to have a true conversation so I, I actually just take it you know a little bit one step removed from like a company strategy and more just think about it as a person um, and that's that's you know a huge differentiator between us and another beauty company is it's not really a marketing strategy it's just who we are you know so interesting as well to get all of that feedback one-on-one -on -one with the customer for an entire year and putting the effort in that then exponentially gets rewarded. But it seems to me that the number one user when looking at the development of the product lines and the marketing strategies that you execute on, the number one user seems to be you. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives your company you know, a great frequency or authentic, re really uh, a great authenticity uh, and organic feel to who the company is and the purpose and the passion behind it. How important is it that, you know, you are the number one user and beyond the feedback you received, you're not only the number one user, but the number one fan of your own product. <laughs> yeah, I am the number one fan. Um, I think that's an appropriate characterization. I think it's really important, um, but it's not a, necessarily about like me and my experience, my preference. It's about like, I'm, I'm a critical person. Like, I think that's just important. Um, here is that I am someone who's like very critical when it comes to a product on the table or the work that I do, the standards that I have generally. And that that is, um, you know, something that is, is a gift and a curse sometimes. Right. And but when I look at a product, um, I I'm very much a representation of like everything that I learn and continuously study about our customer. Um, and then that's the approach that I'll take when I evaluate a product. It's less about Priscilla and like my, my very specific preferences and more about I am so dedicated to studying our customer on a daily basis. Like I will answer DMs on Instagram, even though we have a team to do that every single day. On the weekends, I do that myself. I don't do every single one, but I go into them and I just see what people are asking us see what their feedback is. And I really take the time to study our customer. And that's how I develop my point of view when it comes to evaluating a product. So it, it's important that I'm the number one fan, but I'm representative of a much larger effort to study um, my consumer. You know, the last question I have revolves around being a parent. Uh, you know, I have a philosophy of mm -hmm. my children. I have three beautiful daughters, all uh, 21, 19, and 16, entrepreneurial, and, you know, very much remind me of you. And I always tell them, I know you're not going to listen to me, but watch me because I used to watch my mom. And it sounds like you watch your mom. And now so many young women have the opportunity to watch you uh, through all the achievements, academic, entrepreneurial, financially, all of these different things, and also consciously. Uh, what would be next for you and your vision uh, and your mission in empowering more young women uh, to take the opportunities and take advantage of the opportunities and execute on those opportunities like you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I think it's what you said, it's, it's observing the examples that are out there. I think that like with every generation, we, we, we have more and more of those examples. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's about um, there, I think, action is just so important and it's as a parent encouraging action or as a person in your own career um, prioritizing action um, because everybody can have a good idea everybody can have you know um, a good understanding of like what what could be successful maybe but it's really about like acting and um and, and putting like one foot in front of the other. And, and that's what ultimately gives you the most experience. Um, and so I think for um, all like women generally, it's just 
so important to take the examples that we have and to be able to um, just know that like you are so empowered to do something about that too. And um, it's all of our collective actions that, that are inspiring this next generation. So that's what's really, really exciting. But um, to me, it's just, it's really the key is um, just doing stuff and, um, and, and using everything that you've seen to inspire like true action. That's amazing. Now I did lie to you because I have one more quick question. Are you gonna make your <laughs> children work at fast food for their first uh, job? A hundred percent. We there's already talked truth. about that. And so they say, here's the truth. I hope your mom's watching because she knows that she's done such a tremendous job raising you. That's the key answer right there. Priscilla Sai, the founder <laughs> of Coco Kind, an extraordinary entrepreneur, empowering so many people, especially women, through her excellent example of what it takes to be successful, passionate, purposeful, and even profitable. Thank you so much, Priscilla.